Tuesdays with Maury, the fourth Tuesday we talk about death. Let's begin with this idea, Maury said. Everyone knows they're going to die, but nobody believes it. He was in a business-like mood this Tuesday. The subject was death, the first item on my list. Before I arrived, Maury had scribbled a few notes and small white pieces of paper so that he wouldn't forget. His shaky handwriting was now indecipherable to everyone but him. It was almost Labor Day, and though the office window I could see the spinach-colored hedges in the backyard and hear the yells of children playing down the street. The last week of freedom before school began. Back in Detroit. I'm just kidding, he doesn't say it like that. I know, he told me. Back in Detroit, the newspaper strikers were gearing up for a huge holiday demonstration to show their solidarity of unions against management. On the plane ride in, I had read about a woman who had shot her husband and two daughters as they lay sleeping, claiming she was protecting them from the bad people. You know, uh, my mom had uh, schizophrenia, and uh, I remember uh, when she was on a lot of medication, which took away the schizophrenia. If she stopped the medication, it would come back. But one time me and her were watching TV, I was like maybe 14, 15 years old. She never had custody of us, but I would be, I would, all but our kids for two sets of twins would go and visit her. And I was closest to her, I would visit her most often. And one day I was at her house and we were watching TV. And they were talking about this woman who like drowned her poor children in a bathtub. And uh, she, we were watching the news story and, and, and uh, my mom was telling me, she's like, yeah, you know, even when I had schizophrenia and I was bad in the head, I would never hurt you or your brother, you know. Or and I would never hurt either of my two twin sets of twins. I love all of you dearly. I would never hurt you no matter how bad mentally I was. And uh, she said that and uh, I was like, okay, okay, you know, but it's something I always remembered. And uh, when she ended up taking her life a few years later, um, you know, I didn't really understand it at first. I was like, somebody must have done something, you know, why would she do that? But I know she did take her own life and she consciously made that decision too, even because she couldn't deal with the schizophrenia or being drugged out on meds. So. Anyways, uh, back to the reading. <laughs> okay, uh, here in Maury's office, life went on one precious day at a time. Now we sat together a few feet from the new addition to the house, an oxygen gin machine. It was small and portable, about knee high. On some nights, when he couldn't get enough air to swallow, Maury attached the long plastic tubing to his nose, clamping on his nostrils like a leech. I hated the idea of Maury connected to a machine of any kind and tried not to look at it as Maury spoke. Everyone knows they're going to die, he said, but nobody believes it. If we did, we would do things differently. So we kid ourselves about death, I said. Yes, but there's a better approach. To know you're going to die and to be prepared for it at any time. That's better. That way you can actually be more involved in your life with, while you're living. How can you ever be prepared to die? Do what the Buddhists do. Every day, have a little bird on your shoulder that asks, Is today the day? Am I ready? Am I doing all I need to do? Am I being the person I want to be? He turned his head to his shoulder as if the bird were there now. Is today the day that I die? He asked. Maury borrowed freely from all religions. He was a born Jewish. He was a born Jewish, but became an agnostic when he was a teenager, partly because all that happened to him as a child. He enjoyed some of the philosophies of Buddhism and Christianity, and he still felt at home culturally in Judaism. He was a religious mutt, which made him even more open to the students he taught over the years, and the things he was saying in his final moments on earth seemed to transcend all religious differences. Death has a way of doing that. The truth is, Mitch, he said, once you learn how to die, you learn how to live. I nodded. He said, once you learn how to die, you learn how to live. He smiled, and I realized what he was doing. He was making sure I absorbed, absorbed the, this point without embarrassing me by asking. It was part of what made him a good teacher. Did you think much about death before you got sick, I asked? No, Maury smiled. I was like everyone else. I once told a friend of mine, in a moment of exuberance, I'm going to be the healthiest old man that ever lived. How old were you? In my 60s. So you were optimistic. Why not? Like I said, no one really believes they're going to die. But everyone knows someone who has died, I said. Why is it so hard to think about dying? 
Because, Maury continued, most of us all walk around as if we're sleepwalking. We really don't experience the world fully because we're half asleep, doing things we automatically think we have to do. And facing death changes all that? Oh, yes. You strip away all of that stuff and you focus on the essentials. When you realize you're going to die, you see everything much differently. He sighed. Learn how to die and learn how to live. I noticed that he quivered now when he moved his hands. His glasses hung around his neck, and when he lifted them to his eyes, they slid around his temples as if he were trying to put them on someone else in the dark. I reached, I reached over to help guide them over his ears. Thank you, Maury whispered. He smiled when my hand brushed up against his head. The slightest human contact was immediate joy. Mitch, can I tell you something? Of course, I said. You might not like it. Why not? Well, the truth is, if you really listen to that bird on your shoulder, if you accept that you can die at any time, then you might find not to be as ambitious as you are. I forced a small grin. The things you spend so much time on, time on all this work you do, might not seem as important. You might have to make room for some more spiritual things. Spiritual things? You hate that word, don't you? Spiritual. You think it's a touchy-feely stuff. Well, I said, he tried to wink. A bad try. And I broke down and laughed. Mitch, he said, laughing along, even I don't know what spiritual development really means, but I do know we're deficient in some way. We're too involved in materialistic things, and they don't satisfy us. The loving relationships we have, the universe around us, we take these things for granted. He nodded toward the window with the sunshine streaming in. You see that? You can go out there, outside, any time. You can run up and down the block and go crazy. I can't do that. I can't go out. I can't run. I can't be out there without fear of getting sick. But what you want? I appreciate that window more than you do. Appreciate it? Yes, I look out that window every day. I notice the change in the trees, how strong the wind is blowing. It's as if I can see time actually passing through the window pane. Because I know my time is almost done. I am drawn to nature like seeing it for the first time. He stopped, and for a moment we both just looked out the window. I tried to see what he saw. I tried to see time and seasons, my life passing in slow motion. Maury dropped his head slightly and curled it toward his shoulder. Is today the day, little bird? Is today the day, little bird? Letters from around the world kept coming to Maury, thanks to the Nightline appearance. He would sit when he was up to it and dictate the responses to friends and families who gathered for their letter writing sessions. One Sunday, when his sons, Rob and John, were home, they all gathered in the living room. Maury sat in his wheelchair, his skinny legs under a blanket. When he got cold, one of his help threw striped a nylon jacket over his shoulder. What's the first letter, Maury said. A colleague read a note from a woman named Nancy who had lost her mother to ALS. She wrote to say how much she had suffered through the loss and how she knew that Maury must be suffering too. All right, Maury said when reading was complete. He shut his eyes. Let's start by saying, Dear Nancy, you touched me very much with the story of your mother, and I understand what you went through. There is sadness and suffering on both parts. Grieving has been good for me, and I hope it has been good for you also. You might want to change that last line, Rob said. Maury thought for a second and said, you're right. How about, I hope you can find the healing power in grieving. Is that better? Rob nodded. Add thank you, Maury, Maury said. Maury said, add thank you, Maury, Maury said. Another letter was read from a woman named Jane who was thanking him for inspiration on the Nightline program. She referred to him as a prophet. That's a very high compliment, said a colleague. A prophet. Maury made a face. He obviously didn't agree with the assessment. Let's thank her for her high praise and tell her I'm glad my words meant something to her. And don't forget to sign. Thank you, Maury. There was a letter from a man in England who had lost his mother and asked Maury to help her contact her through the spiritual world. There was a letter from a couple who wanted to drive to Boston to meet him. There was a long letter from a former graduate student who wrote about her life after the university. It told of a murder-suicide and three stillborn births. It told of a mother who died from ALS. It expressed fear that she... The daughter would also contract the disease. It went on, two pages, three pages, four pages. Maury sat through the long, grim tale. When it was finally finished, he said softly, Well, what do we answer? <laughs> the group was quiet. Finally, Rob said, How about, thanks for your long letter? Everyone laughed. Maury looked at his son and beamed. 
That's cool. And War is happy with his son too. That's awesome. The newspaper near his chair has a photo of a Boston baseball player who is smiling after pitching a shutout. Of all the diseases, I think to myself, Maury gets the one named after an athlete. You remember Lou Gehrig, I asked? I remember handing him in the stadium saying goodbye, so you remember the famous line? Which one? Come on, Lou Gehrig, pride of the Yankees, the speech that echoes the loudspeakers. Remind me, Maury says, do the speech. Through the open window, I hear the sound of a garbage truck. Although it is hot, Maury is wearing long sleeves with a blanket over his legs, his skin pale. The disease owns him. I raise my voice and do the Gehrig imitation where the words bounce off the stadium walls. Today I feel like the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Maury closes his eyes and nods slowly. Yeah, well, I didn't say that. <laughs> That's good. That was uh, Tuesdays with Maury. Um, that was the uh, fourth Tuesday with Tuesdays with Maury. My name is Gregory Brandt. Hit the like and subscribe button and check out my other channels too. My original channel, Gregory Brandt, and uh, there's Joe Gonzo, but about the Joe Gonzo.